Right, so our last talk is an extended talk by Phil Jansen. Um, it's titled, Where to with AI? Okay, thank you very much and welcome everyone to this uh, talk on the limits of artificial intelligence, AI, or in fact, the limits of human intelligence, HI, if you want to call it that. There's much more material in the coming slides than I can afford to cover in the, 15, in the 45 minutes that I have. So if you're interested to dig deeper into that, copy down this tiny URL to my Dropbox and download the document, the complete thing, uh, from there. Now, this talk is meant to be for a general audience interested in the links between AI and philosophy. So, it remains at a very high level. It will not teach any AI to computer scientists, and it certainly will not teach any metaphysics to philosophers. But it might teach both sides something about the other side, and it can teach anyone else uh, something about interesting and puzzling existential questions. Please note also that the talk is not the result of any of my own research. I've been retired for nine months now. Uh, the talk is based on some 30 books and lots of articles and, and videos by famous thinkers, uh, which I've tried to gather on this one talk on, on the topic. Okay, so what is so special about artificial intelligence? In his book on spiritual machines, a 99 book, fairly old, Ray Kurzweil observed that progress is accelerating since the appearance of life on Earth. In a more recent book, Kevin Kelly, the founder of the Wired magazine, observed that exact same phenomenon in the specific context of information technology. And one of the 12 reasons why he thinks that we're going around this cycle here all the time faster and faster is because everything is becoming intelligent. Artificially intelligent. So then, the key question for this talk is if when and how artificial intelligence might overtake human intelligence, accelerate, and get out of our control. In his book, Life 3.0, the Swedish-American MIT physicist Max Tegmark distinguishes three stages in life. In Life 1.0, which was from the beginning of life up to the emergence of Homo sapiens, Evolution was driven by Darwin's natural selection. In Life 2.0, from the birth of Homo sapiens, if you want, until today, our intelligence became too fast, too powerful, for natural selection to keep up and to continue evolving. And instead, evolution was further driven by our own socio-political systems. In Life 3.0, which Max Tegmark thinks is from now onwards, technology is now evolving, progressing too fast for even our social political systems to keep up. Religions and politics used to be headlights, but they're more like taillights nowadays. Isaac Asimov once expressed or said or wrote that Science is building up capabilities faster than society is building up wisdom. So could it be that artificial intelligence could take over evolution? In fact, could it be that intelligence always was the underlying driver of evolution and AI could first complement, eventually overtake, supersede and wipe out human intelligence, wipe us out as a species? In other words, could Clayton Christensen's innovator dilemma apply to HI, human intelligence, seen as a technology or as a company selling technology? Could it be that artificial intelligence has reached its plateau of productivity in this Gartner hype cycle and will relegate human intelligence to a technology of the past? We will address the question in six steps. First, we will sketch um, very superficially what is AI, a very sketchy definition of AI. Second, we will point out some fundamental limits to computing and therefore also to AI, presumably. Nothing new for computer scientists, of course. Next, we will discuss what is called the singularity, 
the hypothetical point at which AI overtakes human intelligence. Then we will list some of the key risks that are associated with AI, whether or not it reaches the singularity, which will lead us to ponder over the metaphysical ruminations of some giant thinkers in the field before we conclude by putting the subject in perspective with respect to other existential threats. But first things first, let's talk about what is AI at this very high superficial level. Alan Turing, who broke the Nazi crypto codes in World War II and gave his name to the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in computer science, defined a very primitive machine called the Turing machine, which you see up here. This machine consists of a very simple, endless paper tape that you can roll back and forth, read, erase, and rewrite as you wish. But he then proved that no matter how primitive and stupid that machine seems to be, it is as powerful as any future computer, even if those future computers are ca capable of gazillions of information uh, transactions, uh, computations per second. Nota bene, RNA polymerase, which synthesizes the proteins out of which we're made from our DNA, is in fact nothing else but a computer, and in that sense, a simple Turing machine, a biological one at that. The notion of AI was suggested in the mid-50s by Professor John McCarthy in Stanford, who, by the way, received the Turing Award. Larry Tesler once defined artificial intelligence with the tongue-in-cheek sentence, it's anything that computers still cannot do. Now, most seriously, Alan Turing, again the same guy, defined the AI Turing test as follows. If a person C in a room here can ask questions from a person B in another room and a computer in another room and not be able to tell the difference between the answers of A and the answers of B, in other words, both sound human, then computer A is, in effect, artificially intelligent. In other words, a computer exhibits AI if it has human cognitive abilities, that is, if it can simulate a human brain by behaving like one. Our brain consists of neurons and synapses. Neurons are like small computers with inputs and outputs, and the synapses connect the outputs of some neurons to the inputs of other neurons as depicted here. Many research projects are trying to build computers that model exactly that sort of arrangement. One of these is the Human Brain Project, which presumably many of you have heard about since it's led uh, by EPFL and ETH, as well as by another hundred participating institutions. Another one is the U.S. DARPA Synapse Project, which IBM is involved in. The first IBM Synapse chip, using 4,000 processors consuming 63 milliwatts to simulate a quarter of a million synapses connecting one million neurons. IBM's target is a two-cubic decimeter synapse computer consuming four kilowatts to simulate 10 to the 14 synapses connecting 10 billion neurons. Note that a human brain still has 10 times more neurons and synapses, but measures only one and a half cubic decimeter, uses only 20 milliwatts, and achieves 10 to the 16 computations per second. Computers are thus still a few orders of magnitude away from brains, but they could get there in 10 to 100 years. The difference between conventional computers and AI computers is that AI computers are capable of learning by themselves, learning to program themselves, using three increasingly powerful techniques. With the first technique, which you see here, called supervised or deep learning, all the AI computers learn the world by examples fed to them by humans. With the second technique, called reinforcement or evolutionary learning, AI computers improve their programs by trial and error, very much the same way that natural selection works under Darwin's genetic evolution. They try things towards a given goal, such as winning a game of chess or Go, and they learn from feedback what works and what doesn't. With the third technique, called unsupervised or inverse reinforcement learning, AI computers could learn entirely by themselves, 
sort of like the way children learn from their parents, by simply imitating, doing like human beings. Here's a simplified picture of an AI computer of the first kind, using supervised learning called deep learning. Deep because such computers are built like neural networks, lining up layer behind layer of neurons that are all talking to one another. They're taught to recognize and classify inputs on the left, through a simple but intense voting system among the neurons, and to deliver an answer on the right saying what this picture or music or film or whatever is. And here's an example of a scenario of the second kind, reinforcement learning, called a generative adversarial network. A teaching AI on the left side, here, is feeding challenges to a learning AI on the right side, and trains it by giving it positive or negative feedback, constantly pushing the limits of its capabilities. This is exactly how Google's DeepMind Alpha Zero AI was taught in one day on December 6, 2017, how to beat several world champions at their own games. In particular, Google's own AlphaGo AI, which had itself beaten the world champion, the human world champion at the game of Go, and Stockfish, which was at the time the best chess program in the world. Here's a concrete example of a reinforcement learning AI robot made up of three wood sticks and two powered hinges. It was not told what moving means nor how to do it, just that it needed to move right and towards the back, here. In the first part of the video, the robot is moving pretty randomly and aimlessly. In this second part, it gets better, and in the third part, you will see in a second that it's got the move back and right under control. There we go. Give it a couple of seconds. And you can see that it's got it nailed down. Okay? All right. Now, AI has already had major impact in all of these fields that you see here in green on the left. Geology, transport, advertising, language translation, finance, health administration, cybersecurity, etc. And it will surely have a lot of impact in the future in these further fields of climate and environment management, material science, energy production, resource recycling, medicine, education, politics, economy, etc., etc. So now that we sketched very briefly, very high level, what AI is up to today, let us talk about some fundamental limits to computation and artificial intelligence. One might think that computers can compute anything. This is, in fact, not true, as I'm sure some of you computer scientists know. Computers execute programs. Programs are texts, and texts can be listed in alphabetical order. There are very many programs, but since they can be ordered, they can be counted, one, two, three, four, up to however many there are. Mathematical functions, by contrast, cannot be ordered in any particular way, and therefore it is not possible to count them, one, two, three, even to infinity. Thus, there are very many more math functions than there are programs, and therefore most functions cannot be programmed on a computer. In particular, many functions describing natural phenomena cannot be programmed exactly, accurately, on a computer. A good example of that is a real random number generator. A real one. Of course, you've got random number generators on computers. But after a while, they will repeat the sequence of numbers. They're not completely random. Okay? It seems that quantum physics uncertainty principle, which limits measurability of exactly determining where a particle is, also somehow limits computability. Even formal math and logic cannot overcome certain computability limits. For instance, circular statements may lead to inconsistencies and contradictions, such as you see on these drawings by the Belgian cartoonist Philippe Gluck and by the Dutch artist Maurits Escher. Similarly, this statement by the Cretan philosopher Epimenides is paradoxical because it always contradicts itself since Epimenides himself is Cretan. And the same is true 
for this paradoxical sentence from Berry and Russell, which defines in 14 words a number whose definition says it requires at least 20. Makes no sense. Undecidable. Meaningless. Such self-referring statements pose many problems that lead to undecidability and inconsistency. So, for instance, Alan Turing, again the same guy, proved that, that no program can ever prove whether a program always terminates, because a program cannot prove that about another program. The Czech-Austrian mathematician, Kurt Gödel, proved that no formal system, such as, such as math or logic, can ever prove itself to be at the same time complete and consistent. If it's consistent, it must be incomplete. And if it's complete, it must have contradictory statements in it. The American physicist Douglas Hofstetter wrote a fantastic book on self-references in which he underlines the difference between programs written by humans and programs developed by AI computers themselves, written, developed by AI computers themselves. The former, developed by humans, simply process data. But the latter are a form of developing yourself for your self-improvement. That sounds like Darwin in new clothes. In view of Gödel's theorem, one can therefore really wonder whether AI, or for that matter, human intelligence, can ever be consistent and complete. In fact, in his book about the egoistical gene, the British biologist Richard Dawkins raised the circular question, are genes meant to reproduce, reproduce us phenotypes, or are we phenotypes meant to reproduce genes? A very well put circular question, which of course cannot be decided. In his 94 books, The Shadows of the Mind, the British mathematician, physicist, and philosopher Sir Roger Penrose talks about three worlds. The real world, the mental world that we build an image in our head, and the platonic mathematical world. He contends that our mental world has captured only a fraction of the real physical world. Makes a lot of sense. That math and computers represent only a fraction of what our mental intelligence is capable of. And that the real physical world lives by only a fraction of what math can express. So there you go, another loop, due to which certain questions may be fundamentally hard, if not impossible, to answer. So in the end, what is or is not computable or decidable? Left, we have trivial problems that can be tabulated. For instance, what's the list of all countries in the world? In green are problems that are easily computable. We know how to do it, and we know how to do it efficiently within our lifetime. In orange are problems that are computable in theory, but not in practice, because they're too complicated. We would know how to do it, but it would take forever. And in red are problems that are fundamentally because of circularity, self-references, or whatever, not computable and not decidable. At the boundary between green and orange are surprising so-called NP problems, for which the perfect solution is not computable efficiently. However, approximate solutions are easily computable. An example of that is the case of the question of what is the shortest path for passing through n places just once, for instance, visiting the 26 Swiss canton capitals. One can easily imagine a number of solutions for traveling from Geneva to St. Gallen and, and around in any order that you wish, okay, and compare them and always pick a better one. However, finding the absolute shortest of the 400 plus trillion trillion possible solutions is not computable. It would take millions of years. Note, however, that in 2019, a Japanese researcher team discovered a giant amoeba that's capable of solving the problem in linear time, proportional to the number of places visited. So much for biological intelligence versus computer intelligence. And here is an example of an orange computation that is conceptually trivial, 
but still um, even, even approximately uh, or completely trivial, but in practical, even if you want to do it approximately. CERN generates one petabytes of data per week. If you wanted to compare each data item with every other data item, that would be very easy, and conceptually it's easy to do that, just have do loop, okay? But totally unrealistic. At the rate of 10 billion comparisons per second, that would still take 300 million years. Bottom line, computability has its limits, both absolute and efficiently practical. Now that we have some idea of AI and some idea of its limitations, let's talk about that famous singularity. In the AI context, the singularity is a hypothetical point in time when AI would overtake human intelligence, reproduce and improve itself so fast and irreversibly that it could escape mankind's control and wipe us out. How is that possible, you might ask? Well, Darwinian evolution managed to create, out of atoms, intelligent humans that are killing off other life forms. So why couldn't we, intelligent humans, out of the same atoms, create super-intelligent AI robots that might end up killing us. Does that sound plausible at all? Yes, because already in 1896, James Baldwin showed that Darwinian evolution favors the more learned and knowledgeable life forms, leading to ever more intelligence. So thus, it seems legitimate to contend that intelligence is a fundamental ingredient of evolution so that AI could be the natural next step after human intelligence accelerate and eliminate us. In a 2019 survey, 25% of AI experts felt that this singularity is impossible, will never happen. But two-thirds of those experts believe it will happen in more than 20 year, 25 years. And a small percentage, as you can see here in blue, a small percentage of them even believe it might be achieved in the next 10 to 25 years. If you like, you can explore and participate yourself in this online Future of Life survey. In his book on Shadows of the Mind, which we already mentioned, Roger Penrose envisions five possible futures for AI, which he calls A, B, C, and D. According to A, Artificial intelligence would reach full human intelligence capabilities, including self-referencing, self-awareness, introspection, conscience, etc., the true singularity. According to scenario B, AI would perfectly pass the Turing test, but without conscience, without self-reference, without being aware of itself. Sort of a mindless singularity. According to C, AI would overtake HI, but only subject to some major scientific discoveries that are still missing today. And according to D, AI will never reach human intelligence capabilities because those capabilities are not accessible to computers. Fundamentally impossible. Roger Penrose believes that C is the most likely scenario. Personally, I have the gut feeling that B or C without conscience, without self-awareness, is possible. But A or C with conscience, with self-awareness, if at all possible, could be highly undesirable. Because if Gödel's theorems apply to AI programs as it does to all other programs, then a complete AI with self-reference would be as inconsistent and susceptible to contradictions as we human beings are. Religious people, of course, believe in D because A, B or C would in some sense mean that mankind can create life forms beyond those defined by God. For lack of time, I leave you this slide as an offline, an offline reading exercise. It shows where some famous experts stand with respect to the singularity, some being positive and optimistic, others more prudent, and some are really concerned. This slide I also leave to your offline reading uh, time. It sketches why and how MIT's Rod Brooks and others are skeptic about this singularity. However, as Arthur Clarke's first law says, when a scientist thinks that something is possible, she's usually right, but when she thinks it's impossible, she is possibly wrong. And that is exactly what happened to Lord Rutherford on September 9, 19. 33, September 11, 1993, 
when he said that nuclear power was moonshine. 24 hours later, Leo Sillard published a paper on how to do it. So what is AI actually missing to reach human capabilities? Does intelligence really require the biology of a body? The French neuroscientist Stan Dehaan, the American AI professor Brian Cantwell-Smith, and the Israeli historian Yuval Harari inspired me the following picture of human intelligence. Computers are capable, as we are, of perception using various sensors. But unconsciousness in the sense of instinct is something already largely beyond them. Just like sensibility, and uh, including suffering, and consciousness and judgment, thanks to which we enjoy introspection, subjectivity, we understand causality, we can develop insight, intuition, wishes, assign responsibility, define objectives, roles, meanings, values, and ethics for ourselves. This embodies all of the self-referring thing that I personally believe to either be impossible or else pretty risky, leading to an inconsistent AI. Then there's creativity, which computers are increasingly capable of, and finally data processing, including memory and communication, where they are, of course, way better than we are. Our capabilities right of this picture feed those on the left. The last four are so-called emergent in the sense that they emerge from the brain as a whole, not from individual neurons, exactly like the feeling of wetness emerges from a water bucket, but not from individual water molecules. Children and animals are born with the capabilities in the green arc segment. Computers are only capable of those in the red arc segment. So how should or could the capabilities that they are missing today be modeled and programmed in the future? Ontological models of the world come from intelligence, not the other way around. We developed our own models with our own intelligence, whereas AI is only merely building on the models that we feed it. This slide is also an offline reading exercise. In a nutshell, the British neuroscientist Carl Friston contends that life and intelligence are driven by his principle of free energy, according to which living entities are driven to minimize the gap between their actual energy level and the energy level they would ideally like to be in. Thus, he contends, life is chaotic to the square because entities react chaotically to the already chaotic behavior of other entities. All this is food for philosophical brainstorming, but before we get there, we will look at some of the main risks that AI poses to mankind, singularity or not. The hope was that the Internet would liberate people from overly powerful institutions. The reality is that an oligarchy of unelected GAFAM big tech helps nation-states to invade our brains and our private lives. As a result, people's behavior are systematically monitored, analyzed, algorithmically steered, and eventually manipulated, which effectively leads to a form of societal regulation through surveillance and digital control. So that's the first risk of artificial intelligence coming out of Amazon and Google and all of these companies. That risk is reinforced by biased and synthetically fabricated information, fake news, deep fakes, etc. AI-created fakes are increasingly hard to detect, but easy to synthesize. See, for instance, this Obama deep fake by Jordan Peele, which is clearly a fake, but otherwise it's perfect. Anyone can create and spread such fake things without the liability of professional media. And because such fakes are more sensational than reality, they tend to spread and propagate faster, thus encouraging opinion polarization. They have thus become a strategy for populist politicians like Trump, who dangerously threaten democracy, in that they propagate lies and then accuse censorship of violating their freedom of expression. The third risk is the development of AI weapons, including cyber war weapons. AI weapons such as drones have already been used since many years, including in January of this year by Trump to kill the Iranian army chief. 
So far, such weapons are remotely controlled by humans, but they could very well be completely autonomous and decide by themselves who to kill, which, of course, is totally unethical. AI also has increasingly been used to attack vital IT infrastructures in various countries, paving the way for all-out cyber wars. Such weapons make tanks and fighter planes useless because cyber attacks fly under the radar and are much safer and cheaper for the attacker, yet they can easily paralyze the national water, sewer, health, gas, power, transport, telecom or financial systems and leave the attacked country easier to take over without the level of destruction of a physical war. A fourth much talked about AI risk is the job destruction and the creation of a digital chasm. In a 1965 report from the NASA, they humorously defined people as the least expensive all-around production tool that could be mass-produced by untrained workers, namely fathers and mothers, very humorous. AI robots could, however, completely change that. This graph Time plots workforce sectorial distribution in 10 countries representing 60% of the global manpower. 200 years ago, 90% of the world population was working in agriculture. Following the Industrial Revolution, ever fewer people were needed in agriculture, but ever more in industry. With the rise of industrial robots, ever fewer people are needed in industry, and ever more are moving in tertiary services. So today, in leading economies like the US, Japan, Western Europe, etc., less than 5% of the population works in agriculture, about 15% works in industry, and over 80% in services. Which raises the big question, what are we going to do with these 80% of the people when 70% of their jobs will be taken over by AI programs? Nowhere else to go after services. As Klaus Schwab, the WEF founder and president, observed in his book on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, information storage, transport, replication, and marginal costs are so low that wealth can be created with way fewer people than it used to be the case in the industrial era. So income goes to entrepreneurs instead of going to workers or to the unemployed. This leads to a wealth distribution depicted in Branko Milanovic's famous elephant curve. The rich get richer, the tip of the truss here on the right of the graph. The poor slowly get less poor, they're raising, rising here. But the middle class, which is the trust here, is sinking, is losing buying power. The trick is that the body of the elephant and the head correspond to the developing world, thankfully rising out of poverty, whereas the sinking truss corresponds to all of us, workers and middle-class people in the industrial world. This is why there is more and more talk about universal basic income or universal basic services. The question is what could be called and included in the basic and who's going to pay for that, especially when the middle class sinks and the very wealthy are abusing fiscal optimization or escaping to fiscal paradises. The concern is not only the middle class sinking income, but it is also its jobless feeling of irrelevance and uselessness. This slide is another home reading exercise showing the distribution of wealth in Switzerland in red and in the world in blue. Notice that both horizontal axes, the black net worth and the green income, are logarithmic, covering nine orders of magnitude. That's like from one millimeter to a thousand kilometer. How's that for a wealth chasm? Bottom line, risks get spread among everyone, profits go to the rich, which leads to growing inequalities, segregation, fragmentation of society, tensions, unrest, populism and extremism. In my humble opinion, the biggest risk is that an AI completely self-aware could behave as inconsistently as some humans, and an AI unaware of itself, unaware, unaware of its own programs, would be incomplete and could skid out of control. 
According to Ashby's law, a control system needs to be as complex as what it aims to control, because anything that's not modeled and programmed cannot be controlled. AI can and will increasingly solve problems that we cannot. But while we can understand and explain the programs that we write ourselves, AI cannot yet do that at this stage. It has none of that conscience, self-reference. Or it may become conscious, but then inconsistent. The European Union General Data Protection Regulation requires a right to understand IT systems, but how could that apply to AI that doesn't know how it came up, came up with its own programs? In case of litigation, our justice system must assign responsibilities based on intent or negligence. But could an AI be accused of nefarious intention or negligence? And if not, who could be responsible? Its programmer, its designer, its vendor, its operator? Even if the AI was be behaving properly, it could still be subverted by terrorists, criminals, traitors, or hackers. I also have an offline reading exercise for you on this slide about the rules that the OECD is contemplating for artificial intelligence systems, but I have no time to go through that right now. These risks, up to and including the ultimate singularity, have led numerous scientists and philosophers to ponder over the significance of AI for mankind. If we manage it right, AI could be the biggest achievement of mankind. But if we botch it, AI could escape us and mean the end of mankind. The problem is not whether AI will ever be conscious or not. The problem is whether it could become overly competent, overly zealous, and take the famous paperclip manufacturing examples to its limit, turning everything on Earth, including ourselves, into paperclips. In his Life 3.0 book, Max Tegmark, asked seven questions that need to be answered before it's too late. One, do we want the singularity, superintelligence? Two, do we want people to survive, to be uploaded or simulated in the cloud, or to be completely replaced? Three, do we want to retain control over AI or let it control everything because it's smarter than us? Do we want AI, number four, to become conscious or not? Five, do we want to maximize the positive, minimize the negative, or trust AI to do the best for us? Six, do we want to colonize the universe? And seven, do we want a civilization with a purpose or not? Already in 1532, Rabelais wrote in his Pantagruel, science without conscience is but ruin of the soul. In my humble opinion, the main question is the third one on the previous foil, the control of AI. The trouble is that controlling AI is not about proving that it works. It's about proving that it cannot fail. And a negative proof is something extremely hard to do in general. The first challenge is defining goals for AI. One can easily define explicit, positive, objective goals such as clean up all of the plastic out of the oceans. But it may be impossible to define all implicit negative or subjective goals, such as, for instance, do it without killing all the fish in the ocean. And it may be equally impossible to bar instrumental goals that the AI might develop for itself, such as saying, oh, I'm going to protect myself in such a way that even if humans pull the power plug, I'm not going to die. Also, who should set these goals and non-goals? Should they be the same for the whole universe, or should they be customizable? By whom? Programmers, sellers, operators, politicians, at which level, across which jurisdiction? Then goals cannot always be clear ahead of time. They need to be adapted to fuzzy or random circumstances. They also need to evolve over time because ethics change. Think about the death penalty, slavery, abortion, homosexuality, all of these things that used to be forbidden and these days uh, are either they used to be forbidden, then they are now allowed, or the other way around. On the other hand, human intelligence, and certainly not AI, should retain control of such goal evolution, because otherwise, a smart AI could reintroduce as a goal for itself to protect itself against humans by preventing them from pu pulling the power plug. I'll let you ponder offline these 
examples of AI control rules. Isaac Asimov already proposed some in 1942, although his third rule would precisely prevent men from pulling the power plug. More recently, the European Union and Stuart uh, Russell stated better thought out rules that you can see here or look up on the web. The control of AI raises political issues. Globalization, the internet, social networks, and AI are erasing national borders, but raising cultural fences between us. Science, technology, engineering, math, natural resources, the economy, many sports and arts, the climate, are all global issues. And these global issues cannot be solved by narrow-minded um, ideological populism. The hope is not entirely lost, however. The genetic law of the jungle, which is basically survival of the fittest at any cost, uh, without any mercy or any, any pardon, um, would very dif be, be very difficult uh, to accept. Now, it is possible that that genetic law of the jungle might be replaced by a civilized law of humanism, in the sense that physical wars are serious risks, but their costs increase and their benefits decrease due to the destruction that they cause. On the other hand, the new oil is information and know-how, and those benefit from peace and cooperation. Beyond control and political questions, science, technology, engineering, math, and AI pose deep philosophical questions that they cannot answer. These cultural, mission, meaning, identity questions are traditionally addressed by religions, philosophies, and ideologies. Some of these are clear better, clearly better than others, but which ones and according to whose criteria? Religions, philosophies, and ideologies always dealt with the splits between individualism and collectivism. Individualism is built into our genes, as I just was saying. Survival of the fittest with no central control and no pity or mercy. Collectivism is our phenotype's attempt to limit suffering through equal rights and common ethical controls. Between those two extremes, social democratic humanism seems to me to be the only viable compromise. In that sense, my favorite motto is someone's liberty, see, sorry, someone's liberty stops where someone else's starts. And since hampering someone's liberty causes them suffering, my practical guidelines for humanism in action is don't do to others what you wouldn't want them to do to you. But can artificial intelligence follow such philosophical principles from pure logic to dreaming, to dealing with fuzziness, to understanding causality, to achieving consciousness. I'm a radical atheist, but here are some more meta metaphysical questions about AI and human intelligence. First, should AI get the same rights as humans? A legal entity, human rights, property rights, patent rights, etc. Then, could a superintelligent AI overcome the fundamental limits to computability, to understanding and predictability that seem to be imposed by quantum physics uncertainty principle and by Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Given those limits, can even our own human intelligence ever discover whether the universe has a directed purpose or not? Does our feeling of free will exist only because we have not, not yet discovered such a directed purpose? Or what about this similarly profound question that the late Swiss philosophy professor Jean Hersch once raised? Can an information message, like our DNA, really have neither a cause, a sender, nor a purpose, a receiver? Okay, enough philosophical rumination, let us wrap up. What can we take home from this talk? First of all, this is the future we're sleepwalking into and public administrations are in autopilot. The nuclear risk was immediately clear to everyone because of its destructive power, but the AI risk is subtle and underestimated. Does the world urgently need something like a Geneva Convention for AI with global guidelines about what is or is not acceptable? Neither China nor the USA, who are leading AI these days, help here 
because both err in opposite directions. The USA have taken their usual fully liberal approach of laissez-faire AI by the GAFAM big tech, while China is taking the totalitarian approach of steering everything top-down towards national objectives. The air is human, but it takes a computer to really mess things up. AI could either become conscious and thus as fallible as we are, or else remain consistent, but then be irresponsible. Either way, it represents an existential risk that is the product of the probability of failure by the potential damage, very hard to quantify. But either way, AI also provides a huge potential without which mankind might not survive. Before ending, I would, however, like to put AI challenges in perspective. The media always report on things that sell, namely sensational, often scary or negative news. Yet, according to many authors, such as the Swedish physician Hans Rosling or the Canadian psychologist Steven Pinker, mankind is slowly getting better off. All indicators left on this slide are green and steadily rising over the past 200 years. If you doubt that, go read their books. Now, to remain objective, these authors warn about other indicators right of this slide, which are red. In his 2018 book, Hans Rosling listed the five main existential threats to mankind as he saw them. As a medical doctor, his, his list started with a global pandem pandemic. What foresight, two years ago. Followed by a major war, the climate and environmental crises, the widening wealth gap, and corruption, any of which could inevitably lead to a major economic collapse. AI is not even on that list. But AI remains a key tool to address the challenges on that list. To close, I would like to quote this fabulous statement from Max Frisch, which he made in 1987 at the Technical University in Berlin. Dinosaurs lived 250 million years. How do you envision an economy growing for that long? Max Frisch made one mistake. Dinosaurs only lived 150 million years. Okay, for those interested in this, in the next slide, you can find all the books and articles and journals and videos that I use to compile this talk. Those in bold letters are particularly relevant. Those in a very lighter font, gray, I found less so, and I have only skimmed, but they have interesting arguments. That's more of the same. And with thanks to the following people who have accepted to play guinea pigs for this talk before I had the pleasure to present it here, I would like to thank you all for your time and attention and will be glad to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. Um, we now have some time for questions. Um, are there questions on Slido? Okay. Uh, are there questions from you here in the room? Thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, so at the end, you mentioned that AI risk is minor compared to others. Mm -hmm. um, we see nowadays uh, climate change activism, and it starts uh, raising awareness on the political scene. Do you think it would be now a good time to start the same uh, things with uh, AI um, awareness, to raise AI awareness on a political level? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, for us computer scientists, this AI risk is of course something we can get our teeth into, contrary to the climate risk, which is not exactly our specialty, even though we can certainly help with it. Um, so, is it time to start acting? Yes, and I think um, there are lots of people who are starting to act. If you go to this Future of Life Institute, which was created by Max Stegmark and a bunch of other very famous AI professors in the US, go look at their website. They have an incredible amount of activity going on. So I think 
our technical population is taking action. They are starting to think about that. The trouble is there's a lot of inertia between moving the technical community and convincing the political community to act. And the political community, as you know, as I just described myself, are completely underwater right now with climate problems, with election problems in the US, with the COVID problem, with economic problems, etc. So it's probably pretty hopeless to try to, do the, to try to convince them to do anything about AI right now. But that doesn't mean that we as technicians should not think about that and start planning. And as you can see, the European Union and the OECD at least have produced certain, published certain rules that they would like to see enforced for AI. Now, whether these rules are realistic is up for us to, to judge and, and decide. But I think there are a few um, committees here and there, uh, even in high places, that are starting to think about that. general artificial intelligence in the future or to keep it um, in a proprietary way and only let governments um, monitor that kind of stuff? Another good question. Uh, my personal opinion is uh, this is an area where open source is absolutely key. Now, in that sense, I don't mean that anything produced by a private company should be automatically free for all to use. That's another issue. But at least whatever companies are going to write as programs to do AI, those programs should be open. It should be open for everyone to scrutinize and see how the genetic process inside those program regeneration process is programmed. You know, where are the controls? Can we pull the plug? Can we reprogram them? Can we control them? Can we contain them? Can we link them with, with others, etc.? I think if we don't have um, the ability to look into that code, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to retain control of what's going on. Okay. Um, now, you talked about um, the security aspects of open source versus proprietary code, um, but that brings us to one of the slides that I had here about the cyber war. Okay. Um, it's probably going to be impossible to look into the cyber attack code of Uncle Sam or Xi Jinping or Putin or any of these big guys, okay? That's, those are military secrets. And that's what's partly scary to me, is you don't know what these guys are doing. And in doing what they're doing, they might themselves lose control of their own weapons, okay? Which not only could exterminate their enemies, but it could actually exterminate them themselves. Uh, so you think there's no conceivable way for proprietary software in general, in, in your opinion, is um, broken? Because one example I just had uh, in today's talk was that the nuclear proliferation are well being guarded by proprietary systems and uh, that they're close to power. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's always the dichotomy um, when, when a piece of software has a problem, whether it's an IT security problem or whether it's an AI problem, the problem needs to be fixed, okay? And the question is, what is more responsive? Is a private corporation who's written the piece of code more responsive because it's making money with that code and if the code is no good it's going to stop making money so it's motivated to fix the code ASAP. On the other hand, um, we all know for a fact that sometimes these corporations are aware of holes in their code and they don't patch them because they don't have the resources, they don't have the time, they don't care, they think the potential damage is minimal and, and they keep 
postponing that to the future. If the code is open, armies of you know, free will people can go after it and, and fix it in that sense um, with different priorities in mind, let's put it that way. Okay? Which one's better? I don't know, honestly. I mean, my field is not AI, but my field was IT security for 40 years, so I've dealt with that argument in depth. Um, and even after 40 years, I don't have a crystal ball answer as to you know, which is better. Both have advantages and disadvantages, and I don't see at this point that, that one is visibly better than the other. I'm just concerned in the case of AI that we're not just talking about a hacker getting into our banking system or our water, our water uh, utility or, or power supply or something like that. We're talking about programs that could take over the world. Okay? If, if they escape, it's too late. There's no chance. Okay? So that's why I'm in favor for open software there. Okay? But again, you see um, there's this uh, open AI foundation that was created uh, a while back with that whole idea in mind, and now some of its output is being given, so to speak, to uh, Microsoft or other companies that are taking off with it. So, you know, thing is, you have written the software, it's open source, it could be inspected, but whoever wrote it needs to be paid and they want to make money with it, and so one has to find a compromise between being transparent, being open, being visible, auditable, and at the same time being able to make money. Okay, maybe another question. Um, what do you think is actually at risk? Um, do you think that um, humankind will just lose some control over its environment, or uh, do, you, do you think that uh, at some point um, some artificial intelligence will have the goal to, um, I don't know, maybe um, end all life on this planet or um, something like that? Okay, I, I have trouble, some trouble understanding your question because of your mask, I'm sorry. <laughs> some words escape me. Yeah, so what do you think is actually at risk um, with, with a developing further? Do you think AI will, will take over the planet and uh, kill everything that's, that's living um, in a, I don't know, bio biological or organic way? Or do you think... Um, it will just restrict some of the, the control that we have over um, our environment. I, I think that all depends how it is programmed and by whom it is programmed. If it is programmed by ethical people who are extremely careful and put controls in all kinds of places and retain the control of, over, the, over what this AI programs itself and improves itself to do, uh, then we may be okay. On the other hand, if it's programmed by irresponsible people or people who are determined to, to cause trouble and, and, and break things, um, then yes, hell could break loose. Okay? This is one reason why I think um, one should not imagine the world being governed by one single artificial intelligence, but de facto it will be ruled by a whole bunch of different arti artificial intelligences in, in different areas. It will take quite a while for all these AIs to come together and, and behave as sort of one global brain um, if they ever get it that it's better to cooperate peacefully rather than fight one another. Too early to say. So would you say that uh, the AIs or artificial intelligences that will be created in the near future are something like the, the seed of what will happen after. Yeah, absolutely, sure, definitely, yeah. Now is the time to watch out for these things because if we wait too long, we will lose the control. And once an AI is more intelligent than we are, it'll figure out that we're not needed and it can better evolve itself. Antoine? Um, do you think um, one day we will be able to merge the human biology with the machine? And would it be profitable uh, to do that? Is there a logical explanation to, to this scenario? Okay, my guess is that will happen. It is already happening. I mean, you saw the... Uh 
chemistry Nobel Prize two, three days ago about the CRISPR technology, which basically allows any amount of gene editing uh, that remains biological if you want, but it is gene editing, so it's, it's DNA editing. It's editing Turing machine's uh, tape uh, to generate, you know, to fix problems and generate potentially superhuman beings with superhuman powers and things like that. So I think there's little doubt in my mind that, that we are going to gain more and more bionic organs and members, and there might be a point at which um, even if we cannot make computers be conscious, we could at least dump our factual memory into a computer. This is something I would yeah, tend to believe. I can't put a date on it, but um, I don't think that that's completely unreasonable. So yes, uploading us in the cloud, uh, the body dies, but your mind continues to exist in the cloud. Could be some sort of paradise or hell. Okay. Okay, um, if there are no more questions, then uh, let's close here and uh, thank again our speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs>